You're listening to the Keep Optimizing Podcast to increase your traffic, improve your conversion rates, and grow your profits. Hello and welcome. If you're looking to improve the performance and return on investment of your marketing, then you are in the right place. I'm Chloe Thomas, the host of this Marketing Focus podcast, and it's very, very cool to have you tuning in to our very first episode. I've been working on the idea for this podcast for over a year now and actively making it happen for the last couple of months. So it's brilliant, absolutely awesome to finally have reached the point where I get to share it with you. Because until it gets heard by and helps marketing managers like you, it really doesn't exist. There really is no point to it at all because I've created it all to help you. So it's personally awesome we've reached this point. So thank you very, 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 very much for hitting the play button. Now, because our show is brand new, I am running a big competition where you could win a Keep Optimising podcast t-shirt. Oh yes, t-shirts up for grabs. If you want to enter that, then stay tuned to the very end of the episode to find out how to do it. Now, in this episode, I'm talking to Chad S. White about some of the key lessons from his best-selling book, Email Marketing Rules, because this month, every episode we release is all about email marketing. In today's episode, Chad and I are discussing some of the lessons from his book, focusing in on the key areas that separate the great email marketers from the good ones. That's going to include what to do with your inactive subscribers, what stats to benchmark against, and why you should be focusing on subscriber value rather than campaign performance. We're just about to meet today's guest, but before we do, please check out the sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Klaviyo, the ultimate e-commerce marketing platform for email and SMS messaging. Whether you're launching your e-commerce business or taking your brand to the next level, Klaviyo gives you the tools to get growing faster. That's why it's trusted by over 38,000 e-commerce brands. Build your contact lists and emails that pop and create marketing moments that build valuable customer relationships over any distance. Get started for free today. Visit klaviyo.com slash masterplan to create Create your free account. That's K L A V I Y O dot com slash masterplan. Today I'm chatting with email marketing expert Chad S. White, author of the bestseller Email Marketing Rules, Checklists, Frameworks, and 150 Best Practices for Business Success. It's now in its third edition. Now, by day, Chad is the head of research at Oracle CX Marketing Consulting and in 2018 was named the Email Experience Council's Email Marketer Thought Leader of the Year. Hello, Chad. Hello, Chloe. Thanks for having me on. Uh, It's great to have you here. I mean, third edition best practice book. It was a no brainer to get you here to talk email marketing and and to help the listeners take their email marketing to the next level. But before we get into some some, uh, advice for them, how did you end up working in email marketing? Oh, so uh, like all good email marketers, I fell into the industry. Uh, you know, there's sort of a running joke that no one tries to be an email marketer. They just sort of get like tapped on the shoulder or sort of <laughs> accidentally fall into it. And that's, that's definitely how it happened with me. Um, I used to be a journalist. I, I worked at Dow Jones and, and Condé Nast, uh, both of which are big publishers here in the U.S. And um, I covered uh, retail uh, and and technology. And we used to sign up for all the retailers' email marketing programs to to get an idea of what they were doing because they would announce things to their customers via email. So it was a great way to get leads for stories and. Um, and so I, I, I did that for a number of years. And then my brother uh, started a blog. This was during like the early days of blogs. And being a good competitive brother that I am, I said, hey, well, if my, if my brother can do this, I can do this too. And uh, his was just like a personal blog. But I thought, like, yeah, I could, I could do something else. And you know, what would I write about? And I decided, hey, well, you know, I get all these emails from retailers. I bet I could write about you know, what, what they're doing in their email marketing programs. And so I did. And so I started what was called the retail email blog. And I ran that for six and a half years, posting over 3000 blog posts about what retailers were doing in their email marketing programs. And during that time, um, you know, got hired by the Email Experience Council during its like early months. So I was like employee number three at the EEC. And then from there went on to join 
the direct marketing association and then got it uh, in with an agency, uh, which then got acquired by Responsus, which is now owned by Oracle. And uh, anyway, that was sort of my, my, my way into the industry. So I come at it. I'm not an actual email marketer. I study uh, and work with email marketers. Um, so just to be transparent. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm a, I'm a journalist by trade. And so I've been doing research uh, and, and observing the email marketing industry now for almost 15 years. Uh, you know, I've written three editions of email marketing rules, written tons of research reports, I think close to another thousand blog posts. <laughs> so uh, that that's how I how I fell into the industry. And, and I know that that's, um, you know, not all that unusual compared to a lot of other people who, again, uh, are working on on web stuff or working somewhere else in marketing. And one day their boss says, hey, you know, we need someone to work on this, this email marketing stuff. And like, they they then get tapped and move over and try to do their best. What's quite interesting though is whilst a lot of people have ended up in an email by accident, I think once you start to really get into it, it becomes quite hard to leave. You know, people do stick around. That is definitely true. And so I was um, back in mid March. I was presenting uh, at the Unspam conference, which is run by really good emails, and they had done a survey and they let me present their results, which was awesome. And one of the findings was that um, there were a lot of marketers, email marketers, who uh, anticipated still being in email marketing like five years from now. And I thought that really spoke well to uh, kind of the stickiness of email marketing, but also I think to like this is kind of like sort of uh, a little bit like treasured arcane knowledge. Like email marketing is not like uh, other marketing channels. It has a lot of like quirks and nuances. And if you can learn all those sort of quirks and nuances, it makes you quite valuable. Um, and so we're finding that a lot of email marketers are, are staying in email marketing, which is great. And then others are, are sort of, you know, graduating, you know, up the ladder and becoming, you know, VPs of marketing. And that's great because email marketing is, is all about at its heart sort of data uh, and, you know, and, and CRM and, you know, segmentation and personalization and, you know, all this sort of data driven, um, you know, action. And those are exactly the skills that you need to have if you are going to become, you know, a VP of marketing, a head of marketing and sort of go up the, the food chain. So I think it's great. If you stay in email marketing, I think that's fantastic. I think there's lots of opportunities there. And if you want to take those skills, um, up the chain, I think there's also great possibilities there. I think email marketing is just a fantastic industry to be in, whether or not you plan on being in it for sort of the long term, or if you plan on you know getting the skills necessary uh, to to do something higher. Yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a great lover of email marketing myself, and so you, you mentioned skills there a few times, which means I think we should probably get our way into your book because. Um, to my mind, it's it's an amazing handbook for anyone who wants to take their email marketing up a level. Um, it's one of, I say, occasionally I come across a book I wish I'd written myself, and this is one of those. It's like having having read it, I'm like, well, I'm not going to bother writing an email book now because this one <laughs> this one does what I want it to do. So I, I but I also know that it's going to be sitting on my desk for a long time to come because it, it's one which you can dip back into and grab another nugget. So I think we should probably share some of those nuggets um, with the audience. Um, but what I want to want to start with is, Chad, what led you to decide to write that first edition of the book all the way back in 2013? Yeah. So sort of the overriding principle of the book is that best practices exist. I'm a firm believer in best practices and um, Way back in you know 2012, 2011, like a lot of people were sort of redefining what the term best practices meant. I, I started to hear people saying like, "Well, the best practice is the practice that works best for your company," and that's not really true. That's not what a best practice is. Like I feel that best practices exist at the industry level. It's sort of like crowd wisdom of what works and doesn't work, and it doesn't mean that you have to follow the best practice. And it doesn't mean that you can't tweak it or bend it. You know, people, you know, sort of glorify like bending and breaking rules. And um, I think that's kind of uh, a little bit over 
overdone, overglorified. But the the idea is that you know there is sort of a generally speaking best way to do something, um, and it doesn't mean that you have to do that. It's not dogma or anything. But people were really kind of like dogging on um, on best practices. So I really wanted to make the point. Um, that you know, there are a large number of things in email marketing that are really like very wise things to do. And it doesn't mean you have to, but they're very wise things to do. Great starting points, right? If you don't know what to do, start here. Do this thing. If you don't, in the absence of any other knowledge, do this thing and you'll probably be okay. Now you could experiment and you could innovate and you might be able to kind of bend or break a rule. Uh, that's great. But if you don't know where to start, do this thing. And I, so I really wanted to, you know, really stand up for best practices, sort of explain uh, what I think the term means and, and how you can use them as like a fantastic starting place, a safe starting place uh, for, you know, how to set up your business. And, you know, definitely opportunities to bend and break the rules. Um, most of the rules are not worth <laughs> trying to bend or break. Um, and I did want to draw some hard lines between some rules that I thought were sort of unbreakable around permission and the law, and like, you know, how things are absolutely supposed to work and then everything else, which I feel like is a bit more, a bit more fluid, but I wanted to give people like a safe place to start from. And I think it, it's something I've, you know, I've been doing email marketing, um, as a practitioner, uh, rather than a bit of a study, but certainly as a practitioner for, for well over a decade now. And, I find, you know, working with different companies, advising them on how to improve theirs. And what I find is that a lot of the time people just get stuck in a rut. And I think that's where your book's quite, quite cool is that if you're stuck in a rut, you literally open it, flick the pages and you will find the best practice that you're probably not doing or you've forgotten about to take it to the next level. So, so let's get into some of the advice in the book. And you, you have a whole section about uh, the rules that separate great marketers from good marketers. And I think that's that's what our audience wants to know about is how do they go from being a good email marketer to being a great email marketer? So of all the bits in that section of the book, what would you what would you pick out as being a, an absolute critical one to grab onto? And so I think uh, a great place to really start, and I did spend a lot of time sort of agonizing over sort of the order of the rules and the orders of the sections because they're sort of grouped. Um, and, uh, you know, when I start with success metrics and, uh, and, and email marketing metrics, and I do feel like that is a very foundational place to start. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem like people totally understand what they're trying to accomplish with their email marketing <laughs> or or how they're going to measure it. Um, you mean, Chad, when they're doing the whole, uh, the boss said we have to send out one email a week. So, so long as we send out one email a week, we'll be okay. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, definitely when you get bosses involved and bosses don't always understand how you know marketing is supposed to work. But, you know, for instance, um, you know, usually there's like their program goals which usually revolve around revenue in most cases. Uh, but you could have an email that um, could be highly successful and doesn't drive any direct revenue at all. Um, and so it's about, you know, kind of understanding, you know, how different campaigns can affect things downstream, how you kind of build a dialogue across several emails, especially if it's like an automated, a triggered program, um, but really kind of understanding what, what you're trying to achieve and then linking that very firmly to metrics. Um, I do feel like, like open rates are one of the most misunderstood metrics. Um, opens have a lot of value for sure, but too often people get... Um, you know, in this mode of thinking that like that's like the most important one to optimize or they get confused about uh, open rates uh, in relation to subject lines. Um, I can't tell you how many times I hear people say that they're like A-B testing their subject lines and like their victory metric is opens, which I think it's just a horrible, <laughs> a horrible thing to do because, uh, you know, the subject lines that tend to get the most opens tend to be the most vague. Like we, we are creatures that are attracted to like questions or very curious. So if you're very vague with a subject line, you could really drive uh, a short-term 
boosts and opens, but that's not what you're trying to do with an email marketing relationship. You're trying to build a business relationship. And therefore, I always try to encourage people to have very descriptive subject lines and to gauge their subject lines by how they drive at least clicks, if not even lower down the funnel to conversions. But usually clicks is, is, is pretty indicative of whether or not you're connecting your subject line with the body of your email. But people, you know, people can like, you know, if you if you're using the wrong metrics, it can really send you down the wrong strategy path for how to use all the various parts of email marketing. So uh, analytics, super important, understanding what it is you're trying to do in terms of your goals and connecting those with your, your KPIs. All of that, I feel like is just a very sound place to start. And Chad, I thought one of the interesting um, pieces you, you dwell on in that section was about focusing on subscriber value rather than campaign performance, which I think a lot of e-commerce businesses get hung up on because you know they're worried about how every each and every campaign performs. And then they, they go to an event and they hear someone like you or me saying, you need to send out some quality content, not just buy, buy, buy all the time. Oh, I can't do that because the campaign will go down. And I kind of felt when you're saying about subscriber value rather than campaign performance, that's kind of the first step on creating higher quality content. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of businesses think that they manage campaigns when what they really do is manage customers, or at least they should. I, I don't remember who it was, but years and years ago, um, I heard a guy talk about how like the retailers of the future understand that they're not managing inventory, they're managing customers. And it's this whole idea of like, you know, what like sort of the old school retailer would do is they would acquire products uh, and then they would try to find people to sell the product to. And what the Nouveau retailer does is they have customers and they try to find products to sell to their customers. So it's sort of turning that that relationship on its head where you start with the customers you have, they are the underpinnings of your business, not the things that you're selling, but your customer base is the underpinning of your business. And therefore, you're always trying to serve your customers and find products that that they want to buy. Um, I think that's just a genius way to think about everything you do. And in the world of, of email, I think you know that means focusing on subscribers and managing your relationship with them. And so, um, yeah, content marketing, uh, you know, other types of relationship building exercises, progressive profiling, where you try to figure out, hey, what, what are you interested in? You know, those are, those are activities that aren't going to yield anything as part of that campaign, but they make your future campaigns stronger because they give you, you know, intel on how to better serve your subscribers. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of subscriber lifetime value, you know, looking at how long you're keeping subscribers on your list, how much revenue they generate while they're on your list. And that gets you in the right frame of mind for creating campaigns that you know, really have them in mind versus having yourself in mind and how you want to drive revenue for yourself. Like it, I feel like it puts you in the wrong frame of mind to really be successful long term. It's, it's sort of a, a long term versus short term split there. If you're focused on campaigns, you have a short term focus on your company. And if you're focused on subscribers, then you have more of a long term focus on overall business success. And I think that you, often when companies get focused on campaigns, then it becomes a little bit of a barrier to investing time on welcome sequences and post-purchase sequences because it's like, well, the time I've spent doing that, I could spend doing a campaign and a campaign drives me X rather than seeing that more, more global perspective. But Chad, the next thing I wanted to pick up on um, in that kind of KPIs arena was something which which I say a lot. So I love the fact you had a section on it, which was about benchmarking against yourself not anybody else? Because a lot of people get obsessed with someone else's stats. So do you want to give us give us your take on why that's a bad idea? Yeah. So yeah, we are very benchmark obsessed for sure. And it's kind of to our detriment in general. So over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different brands and be at a lot of different companies have different customer bases. And um, one of the things that's become just painfully clear to me is that 
everybody's business is different, especially true right now. You see how certain companies have been, you know, highly negatively impacted by the pandemic and other ones a bit more neutral and some are actually thriving in this environment. Um, and, you know, it varies by industry, but also by sort of financial situation. Stronger uh, companies that have stronger financial situations have are taking on different strategies. So every company is different. Uh, so that's number one. But in, in email, everybody manages their email marketing program different uh, differently. And they manage their email marketing lists differently. So for instance, you know, going back to like open rates, uh, which again, I'm is a useful metric, but is the is the most easily manipulated. Um, I could go into any company and like double their open rates like tomorrow, and it's just as simple as like not emailing the people who don't tend to open your emails. <laughs> so if you manage your inactive subscribers more tightly than another brand, your open rates are going to be higher. It's just, it's just that simple. Like so, these are just numbers like numbers can be manipulated based on how you manage uh, your business and you know the, the goals and content that you're sending out so yeah i'm not a huge fan of benchmarks uh, most of them uh, are honestly not helpful um you know some of them some of them are for sure. Uh, but most of them are not and so yeah definitely it's about sort of personal improvement. Um, if you have access to benchmarks that are from companies in your same industry of your same size, that's good. But today, you know, that's generally not so easy to get a hold of, especially if you're in a particular industry or at a particular size. Um, you know, especially if you're a larger company, uh, I feel like it makes less and less sense because you tend to have fewer and fewer competitors that are at that same level. But if you're a small business, a small e-commerce business, maybe uh, maybe that benchmark is useful. But um, I think self-improvement is, is really the goal with benchmarks. And you mentioned there um, about managing our inactives on our list, which I think is something which a lot of businesses overlook because they get a bit obsessed with how many did we send the email to this week rather than how many should we have sent the email to this week. So what's your your advice around uh, managing our inactives? I think, um, you know, in Europe, uh, definitely they're a little bit more enlightened than we are here in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., uh, there's, I think, still this frame of thinking that, hey, that person gave us permission to email them. And, and until they actively tell us they, that they don't want us to, we we will continue to email them. Uh, and you know, in the US, there aren't any laws. To the contrary, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the EU, uh, there are laws now that say that you can't endlessly email people. It's, it's a pretty simple idea is that at a certain point, silence means that permission has lapsed. It's it's just kind of that simple, but um, people get wrapped up in like um, you know what's like legally allowed, and people don't like to see their list um, list size fall. They like to see it always growing. The way that I talk about lists is about list productivity. Um, it's uh, it's this idea that. You know, if I if I lose a hundred of my best subscribers and replace them with a hundred low value subscribers, uh, your list size hasn't changed, but your list productivity has gone down because you have replaced some high value subscribers with low value subscribers. So you should be looking at how productive your list is, and I think. If you have that kind of a lens, uh, it becomes a lot easier to let go of inactive subscribers because by their very nature, they're not delivering any value. I think at the same time, uh, while there aren't any laws uh, that say you can't keep inactives you know, forever, um, the inbox providers are providing great incentives for us not to keep these people on because engagement-based filtering uh, is is everywhere and is a huge component of how inbox providers decide where to route your your email to, whether to um, the inbox, to the junk folder, or just to block it entirely. And you know, Gmail uh, 
is definitely probably the harshest master for sure. And they definitely, definitely weight heavily uh, engagement. So you could actually be hurting yourself by holding on to inactives uh, for too long. And it really varies depending on how frequently you send emails um, and a bunch of other factors. So that's sort of the biggest one. Um, but you could actually, you know, by trying to like, you know, have a, a bigger list size by mailing more people, you could actually be hurting uh, the productivity of your email program uh, and diminish your revenue because you could have deliverability issues. And when we're talking about these these inactive people we're suppressing, we're talking about people who aren't opening or clicking. And I get, are we going back maybe a year or two years or less than that, would you say? Yeah. So that's where it really depends on per program. Um, if you are a like deal a day uh, retailer, if you're sending at like, you know, kind of a daily frequency, um, we find that generally um, you're going to hit that that point where inactivity is going to hurt you much sooner could be as soon as three months uh, could be around, you know, I think typically maybe around six months, but it really can vary. But if you're sending, you know, once a week, yeah, you, you could be able to send to inactives for, for much longer, like, you know, up to around two years. Um, it could, it really kind of varies and you kind of, you know, kind of see these things are always evolving. Um, and you, and it could be that like, Oh, you don't have any problems at outlook.com, but you're having problems at Gmail. And so you have to kind of play to the individual inboxes as well. But yeah, so frequency is sort of the biggest factor, but also sort of overall volume. Um, you know, the, the larger your volume is, the more you get scrutinized by the inbox providers. There you go, guys. If you've never done any inactivity management, now is the time to go and take a look at your database um, and see see what it's looking like. For sure. And especially, again, if you're in, in the EU, <laughs> there are laws like GDPR includes, you know, <laughs> mentions of this. So you want to make sure you're not violating GDPR. That's generally not a good thing. Yeah, generally not a good thing at all. And Those fines are pretty hefty. They are. And um, Chad, you mentioned about, you know, if you lose 100 people off your list that were good and you gain 100 terrible people onto your list, um, obviously getting subscribers is something which we're always looking to do as email marketers. And you've, you've got some uh, some good advice around getting those engaged subscribers, not just any old volume. Because it's another, it's like you were saying, you could improve anyone's open rate overnight by getting rid of the inactives. I think any of us could very quickly add 10,000 people to someone's someone's list given the budget, but it, they might not be worth adding. Yes, that's absolutely true. So generally speaking, your best subscribers are going to be the places where your customers are. So I always say like subscriber acquisition sources are the best or the ones that are closest to either your fulfillment operations, so stores, e-commerce, or customer service, be that a, a call center or uh, however else, you know, your servicing your your customers and and it's for the very simple reason that like that's where your customers are that's where people who are transacting with you are so you know getting people who visit your restaurants to sign up for email is a good thing cuz they're already customers cuz they're at your restaurant buying food from you um you know or you know getting people to sign up you know uh, at the uh, point of sale you know and retail is good or even better, like during checkout online, because it's even easier there. Uh, those are all fantastic places because those are customers. So they're already familiar with your brand. They're already sort of sold on, on the value that you bring to the table because they are transacting with you. Those are going to be your best subscribers. And the further you get away from those operations, the dicier the quality becomes. So there are good ways to do list rental, but list rental is often done poorly um, or wrong in many cases where it almost is like just buying lists. Uh, yeah, the, like the list purchase folks have figured out that like, oh, buying lists, quote unquote, is a bad thing. So we'll just call ourselves list rental instead <laughs> to try to be a little bit more legitimate. So you do need to be careful when you're doing any kind of, um, you know, list rental type uh, deal to make sure that everything is aligned the way it should be. Um, but like, you know, that's a case where you're no longer talking to your customers, you're talking to somebody else's 
customers. Um, so there is, by its very nature, like this sort of um, unfamiliarity. So getting people to sign up for your brand that way, you need to do different education. Uh, I think, you know, at that point, doing a double opt-in makes more sense so people understand. Co-registration is the same way. If uh, co-registration is when you have a sign up on somebody else's uh, website. Uh, again, that is also kind of inherently dicey because they may not understand who you are or they think they understand who you are. And so you, there's a lot of opportunities for misunderstandings or um, wrong expectations. So the further you go away from your own operations, the dicier it is. And I think that also includes on social because people engage with brands on social for different reasons. Um, and they may come to a social conversation, not truly knowing what your brand is all about and the value that you offer. Um, so by focusing, you know, I think in general on those acquisition sources closest to your business, you do well. Those are the ones you spend most of your time optimizing and trying to make sure that they are as friction free as possible. That is time well spent. Um, and frankly, when we find that people have um, deliverability problems, uh, often it's either because they're managing their inactives poorly or because they have uh, a subscriber acquisition source that is bad. Um, that they, they, they got a bunch of people from, from this source over here or they found a list, quote unquote. Uh, it happens quite a lot. We found this list. They don't know much about it, but let's send it to these people. They opted in at some point. Uh, that's when you're going to get in trouble. So uh, those, those tend to be like the two like big sources of deliverability issues. Awesome. Well, um, Chad, we're going to pause for a reminder of our sponsors, and then we're going to get talking about the wider world of email marketing. It's safe to say that most of us have been doing more shopping online lately. And if you're an e-commerce brand, that means you might be seeing more first-time customers. But once they've made that first purchase, how do you keep them coming back? Well, that's what Klaviyo is for. Klaviyo is the ultimate email and SMS marketing platform for e-commerce brands. It gives you the tools to build your contact list, send memorable emails, automate key messages and more. Way, way more. Whether you're launching a new business or taking your brand to the next level, Klaviyo can help you get growing faster. And it's free to get started. Visit klaviyo.com slash masterplan to create your free account. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash masterplan. Okay, Chad. So, so far, we've talked about a couple of the areas in your book, Email Marketing Rules, but now you get to wow us with your insider knowledge about the whole of email marketing. So, for the following questions, your answers can be literally anything to do with email marketing. So, Chad, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, let's start with email marketing newbie advice. If we've inspired someone to take their first step with email marketing, what do they need to know to give themselves the best chance of success? Yeah, I think I would go back to like understanding email metrics and goals. I do think that that's foundational. It's hard to be successful if you don't understand how the goals connect with the metrics. I think that's 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 really key. And is and is different. Like the metrics that we use in email marketing are different than you use in in other channels. Um, so I think that's important along with maybe understanding the, the basics of permission, because that also is very different, especially if you're coming from, you know, either a direct marketing or some type of advertising, um, you know, channel, because uh, permission is something that can kind of throw people off. Like it, permission is really <laughs> super critical <laughs> to email marketing in a way that it's, you know, a non-issue and a lot of like sort of advertising type channels. Okay. And uh, now once you've started, of course, with your email marketing, you've got to keep optimizing. So what's your favorite way to improve email marketing performance? You know, it's a kind of a simple, it's just A-B testing is is a really good way to find areas that you can improve. And A-B testing is, is just when you you take what you've been doing and you challenge it with, it, with something different. And it can be really simple. Uh, you could do A-B testing with subject lines. You're just seeing which of two subject lines your audience prefers, but it could also be the color of buttons or the text, you know, the, the call to action that's in a button. Uh, it could be different hero images. It could be a slightly different layout. You can get progressively sort of more radical uh, in the changes um, you know, that you present. That's a great way to make incremental improvements or to try to make some sort of radical improvement. Um, we call them like uh, local maximums versus global maximums. Like 
whatever you're doing, you're on a hill. And if you make really small changes, you could try to get to the top of that hill. But if you try something radical, you might find that, hey, there's another hill nearby that's even taller, that's better. Um, and so if you make a radical change, you might find that new hill that's better. Um, but if you make a bunch of small ones, it helps you get to, you know closer to the, the top of the hill that you're on. Um, so yeah, testing is really key. And I guess the other thing I would say there is that most of the A-B testing that happens is with broadcasts and segmented uh, campaigns. Uh, we tend to see that automated campaigns don't get a lot of A-B testing love. Um, I think that's a missed opportunity because your, your triggered email programs are incredibly productive. They have really high ROIs, much higher ROIs than your broadcast campaigns. Um, and so any sort of incremental improvements that you can make on your triggered campaigns actually pay even more dividends. So it's it can be slightly more difficult to A-B test those because they're sort of ongoing living campaigns. Um, but you'll get much greater results by investing some time in that. I think that is one of the other really big fundamental uh, misunderstandings about email is that we sometimes um, really get bogged down in like the day to day of sending out broadcast campaigns when for a lot of programs, the most important campaigns are those automated programs that they set up and often unfortunately sort of forget about. Um, it, they've been over time sort of lauded as sort of set and forget. And I hate that terminology uh, because it doesn't understand that these email programs are, are living programs, right? They, they live for a period of time. And so they need care and nurturing. You've got to pay attention to them and you got to, you got to feed them and give them attention. You got to optimize them. You got to check on them, make sure they're not breaking. You know, if you make changes to your website, you could find that you have a broken link in one of your automated emails. It's just, you know, churning away, you know, totally unknowing that it's now disconnected from what you're trying to do. Or you have, you know, I've seen automated uh, emails that have like an outdated logo which is not a good look. Um, so it could be like really simple cosmetic things, but then also like really fundamental things like broken links. So um, yeah, it, so when you do your testing, make sure you include your triggered campaigns because the testing you do on those is really going to, to give you great returns. Love it. Okay. Now it's impossible to improve our marketing unless we're monitoring the performance, but the list of stuff we could monitor can be overwhelming. So what for you is the number one email marketing KPI? Yeah, it's tough to to just pick one. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I, I fully recognize that not everybody has like the same level of sophistication. I, I think in a perfect world, you know, something like a subscriber lifetime value is what we should all be gunning for. Um, but I, I, I fully acknowledge that not everyone, you know, has that calculation because uh, it's not necessarily the simplest thing to kind of arrive at. Um, so, but in general, I would say the further down the funnel you can go, the better. Um, uh, again, opens as a success KPI is only truly useful in like diagnosing deliverability problems, to be honest. Um, so I, I hope everyone's going lower down the funnel, at, at least using clicks if not using conversions. But again, it kind of depends on your business and, and what it is that you're trying to drive. So, you know, if you're an e-commerce operation, then you should totally be paying attention to conversions and, you know, revenue per subscriber uh, or revenue per campaign. Um, something like that's really good. But uh, obviously, there's lots of brands um, that don't sell directly. So if you're a CPG company or, you know, you're selling through you know, you're a brand that then sells through retailers, so you're not selling directly. Um, your KPIs might be all around, you know, clicks and getting engagement and like uh, sort of inspiring people to use their products in either novel ways or in the ways that they were intended to be used. So think about, you know, um, a, a brand of say flour, right? Like flour is just flour and nobody buys flour, right? What they're buying is cookies and bread, right? It's because of what it can become. And so if you're a flour brand, uh, hopefully you're using your email marketing program to inspire people with all the different ways that they can transform your flour into something amazing. And so in the, in the confines of that, you'd be looking probably at like, you know, time on list and clicks and things like that. Uh, those, those signs of engagement that you're, you know, inspiring your audience to continue to, to love your product. 
Awesome. And um, finally, Chad, crystal ball time. What's coming up in the next six to 12 months that we should be getting ready for in email marketing? Yeah, I sort of was dreading this question because <laughs> everything is topsy-turvy right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's lots of reasons to be concerned about the future. Um, I mean, the good news is that email marketing uh, continues to be a very effective way to engage with uh, with your customers. And so your investments in email are, are are safe. I think that once again, email has has proven that it's uh, still a very healthy and vibrant channel, um, you know, and that all the naysayers are just running their lips. Uh, so uh, it continues to do well, even in this crazy environment that we're all currently in. But in the next uh, six to twelve months, I mean, I think that the thing that that everyone should be paying attention to right now is 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 how to get nimble and how to get close to subscribers. And so there's, I guess, if I had to leave you with kind of two recommendations, it would be one to really pay attention to your analytics and uh, especially by sort of geo segment and by sort of persona based segmentation, like really kind of diet, you know, try and drill in to your analytics and get a good understanding of exactly what is going on with your customers, because everybody's in sort of like very different places, depending on where they are in the world. Uh, you know, here in the U S we have, um, all the states and some cities like opening and reopening on different schedules. Uh, so geographically, people are in different places you know, mentally, but also some people have very different attitudes uh, than, than others about you know, what they're prepared to, to do and what they're concerned about and what they're valuing. Um, so I think like some persona based uh, tracking is, is also very wise. And, so that's so that's really key. Understand your customers right now. I think it's especially vital going forward. And the other thing is on the sort of the getting nimble side of things is to really reevaluate your email production workflow and try to simplify it. Um, you know, if you're using templates, um, you know, make sure that those are good and solid and helping you create uh, emails more quickly. Uh, we always recommend using a modular email architecture. This is where you sort of build uh, emails kind of like stacking Legos. So you have various components that you kind of pull in and um, some email service providers have sort of kind of WYSIWYG editors that are sort of like that. Um, but you can certainly kind of do that uh, through coding modules as well. Uh, they get sometimes they're called snippets, uh, also things like partials, um, if you want to get more technical, but like that sort of like Lego assembly is, is really wise. When we've done these recently for some of our clients, we've cut email production time by 25%. So it's a pretty significant, you know, accelerator and whether or not you are facing uh, sort of financial cost cutting needs or whether or not you're just trying to get more nimble so you can kind of react to your audience better. Speeding up production is wise. And I think I would also sort of simultaneously say, um, try to avoid things that dramatic, dramatically balloon production time. So I know that, um, you know, that some folks are very excited about AMP for email, I think. Long-term AMP for email is, is really exciting. I think now is exactly the wrong time to be experimenting with that. It's a brand new coding language. You have to essentially code a, a new version, a new MIME type of your email. So it's a lot more work. And when you're trying to... Everyone seems to be really trying to be nimble right now. Like adding things that balloon production time like that seems really unwise. So uh, yeah, try to try to keep it um, a little simple if you can, and definitely do the things that allow that process to move along. And I think I'd also say that uh, also keep an eye on how many cooks you have in the kitchen. I think right now, everyone's like super nervous about saying the wrong thing. And so a lot more people are involved in like reviews and approvals. I understand that. Uh, but that does add a huge amount of drag to the velocity of your production. So just kind of keep that in mind. Like maybe you need to be a little bit more careful, but maybe you don't need like five new layers of approvals. Maybe you only need <laughs> one additional layer of approval. So something to think about. 
it'd be depressing to improve your template, save 25% of your time, and then all of that get taken up on approval rounds. <laughs> yes. And I'm afraid that there's quite a bit of that happening right now. I mean, and people are justifiably concerned about like saying the wrong thing. Uh, and there definitely is a high cost to coming across as, you know, insensitive or profiteering or what have you. Um, but at the same time, you know, people do, uh, email programs are trying to like speed things up. So um, it's just, you know, if you want to make sure that you've got the right balance there. Cool. Well, look, Chad, we are very nearly at the end of the show. Could you please let the listeners know where they can find you and Oracle um, if they want to get in touch? Sure. So I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, you can find me at emailmarketingrules.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Chad S. White and on LinkedIn at Chad S. White. Yeah, I'd love to love to connect with uh, anyone who's listening and wants to talk about email. And uh, obviously, you can find uh, you know Oracle at oracle.com. Uh, you know, Oracle CX Marketing Consulting. We're a group of about 500 consultants within Oracle. It's all focused on marketing, digital marketing. And you, so you can find us um, you know, at, at, at oracle.com slash marketing club. Cool. And then your book, Email Marketing Rules, I know it's on Amazon, certainly as a paperback, because I've got one in my hand right now. Um, is it also Kindle and audio? Uh, there isn't an audio version, but there is a Kindle edition. Yes. Cool. Well, guys, uh, so you can find all of that at Amazon.com as well. Well, look, Chad, thank you so much for being on the Keep Optimizing podcast today. It's been e excellent and fascinating uh, chatting to you about your insights into email marketing. So thank you. Thank you for having me. So how cool was that to get to catch up with Chad? Um, I must admit, I'm a little starstruck. As an author on Amazon, I spend a quite a, a considerable amount of time on there looking at where my book's ranking, who's ranking in other places, what books are selling well, what people are reviewing on books. Um, you know, and, and as part of the podcasts I run, I spend quite a bit of time on there looking for guests. And Chris's book, Email Marketing Rules, is one of those which I'm constantly seeing and constantly going, oh man, if I could ever get him on the podcast, I bet he'd never say no. And they're never quite getting around to ask. So I am, I'm a little bit starstruck and overwhelmed that he came on and and was able to, you know, give such great advice. And it's such a cool place to start our brand new podcast. And this first month where we're focusing on email marketing. If you want to get links, which of course you do, to what we've discussed, to get the full transcript of the episode, that's everything we talked about in written format, so you can print it off and keep it, um, and any important notes and all the rest of it, just go to keepoptimizing.com where you can access everything there is to do with this episode. That's keepoptimizing.com with an S, not a Z, of course. I'd also love to know what you think. This podcast is brand new out the gate and I would really love to know what you think about it. So the easiest way to do that is via Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag keep optimizing. Again, optimizing with an S, not a Z. Um, now, as part of my mission to help you improve your marketing, I've invited our email marketing specialists, so that's Chad from this episode, and my other four email marketing specialists in episodes two, three, four, and five coming up very soon. In fact, two and three you can listen to right now, four and five in the next couple of weeks. I've invited all five of them to join us for a Q&A webinar at the end of the month. Now, this is your chance to get your questions answered. Now, I know a lot of you love the questions I ask, but I'm sure you've got some of your own. So maybe you've taken the um, dealing with inactives that we talked about today and you've started implementing, but you've got some detailed questions about that. Well, come along to the webinar and you'll get the chance to ask that question and get the answer right from Chad in the webinar. How cool is that? So to do that, to, to sign up for the webinar, to find out exactly where it is, et cetera, et cetera, head to keepoptimizing.com. Again, with an S, not a Z. You're going to get so bored of me saying that over the coming months. But there on the website, keepoptimizing.com, you will find out all the details of the webinar. And if the webinar's already happened, you'll be able to play it back and have a listen to the questions that the other listeners asked. And also, I'm really looking forward to getting to connect with some of you guys during the webinar because... Um, it's not very a two-way a podcast. So I'm loving the fact we're going to get to do a bit of connecting, a bit of catching up on that. Now, thank you so much for tuning in even to this first ever episode of the Keep Optimizing podcast. If you're new to the podcast, which you probably are right now, because a lot of people like to start with episode one. And if you're listening to this soon after it's gone live, it's pretty much the only thing you can listen to. If you are new to the podcast, 
do check out episode three, which is definitely live right now, with Louise Reed from Clavio, because in that one, we're focusing in on how email marketing can help a D2C brand. So that's a direct to consumer brand. And I think there's a lot of lessons in there which are really going to help you build on what we've been discussing in this episode. Please do also tell your fellow marketers about the show because I want to help as many marketers as possible to improve the performance of their marketing. One of the easiest ways to spread the word is to take part in our launch competition. So kudos to you for holding out right to the end to find out how you can enter our competition to win a Keep Optimising podcast t-shirt. Yes, we are giving away a t-shirt every week in July and August. To be in with a chance of winning, it's pretty straightforward. This is what you need to do. Find this show on Apple Podcasts. So search for Keep Optimising. Subscribe, rate and review the show. Now, you don't have to give us five stars to win. You just got to rate and review and subscribe. I don't mind. I want your honest feedback on your honest reviews of the show. I don't want you to think if you don't put five stars, I'm not going to pull you out of the hat. We, we're picking the winners randomly. So a nice, honest rating and review and subscribe to the show. All that on Apple Podcasts. Take a screen grab of your review and then share that screen grab on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag keep optimizing. So that's hash K-E-E-P-O-P-T-I-M-I-S-I-N-G. Okay, so hash K-E-E-P-O-P-T-I-M-I-S-I-N-G. We're going to then gather up all the entries and each Wednesday I'll be picking the winner until the 2nd of September 2020. So that's one winner every Wednesday from now until the 2nd of September. So the sooner you do it, the more chances you have to win. Full details about the competition and everything else to do with the show are at keepoptimising.com with an S, not a Z. I hope I get to send you a t-shirt very soon. Have a great week and make sure you listen to the next episode so I can help you to keep optimising your marketing. Access everything Keep Optimising at keepoptimising.com. That's with an S, not a Z.